threat of violence leaves millions of children out of school in northern Nigeria. The Global Learning Foundation X Prize aims to prove the world's poorest children can educate themselves. And international players make their mark in the National Basketball Association. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. Now, at least 30 people are dead in Somalia after an attack by the Al Shabaab terrorist group. Somali government officials say the militants stormed a military base in the town of Barire, 47 kilometers southwest of Mogadishu, using suicide car bombs, followed by fighters armed with heavy machine guns, rocket propelled grenades and other small arms. Uh, meanwhile, on Thursday, security officials say at least seven people were killed when a car carrying a bomb slammed into a minibus at a Mogadishu bus stop. Six other people were wounded in the explosion. There are no claims of responsibility for the attack, and it's unclear who the intended target was. But witnesses say a government security forces vehicle was passing by when the blast occurred. Meanwhile, security officials say some militants appear to be changing their tactics and increasingly increasing their use of targeted assassinations. In September, at least five civilians and uh, two government security officials were gunned down in the capital. Now to the west of the United Nations Children's Agency, UNICEF, says over half of the schools in the northeast Nigerian state of Borno are closed with millions of children unable to start school this year due to the ongoing threat of Boko Haram. UNICEF says almost 1,400 schools have been destroyed in Bono during the Islamist group's eight-year insurgency, and 57% of schools are unable to open because of damage or being in areas that remain unsafe. An estimated three million children are now in need of education, with many also victims of sexual assault, forced into marriage, and up to 100 used as human bombs so far this year. Boko Haram, whose name in, ha in the house of language means Western education is forbidden, is believed to have killed more than 2,000 teachers since the year 2009. <clears throat> now here in Washington, Nigerian civil, uh, civic leaders and U.S. policymakers on Thursday discussed what concrete steps Nigeria and the United States can take to stabilize the West African nation's violence ravaged northeast. Viewer House reporter Maria Bugaji attended the discussion at the U.S. Institute for Peace, and she joins me now to tell us more about the event. Maria, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you, Vincent. Now tell us a little bit more about the event and who were uh, in the panel. Well, you know, uh, Nigeria, as we all know, is facing so many challenges and all fronts. We have the Boko Haram issue, we have the uh, Biafra cessationist movement in the southeast, Niger Delta, all of that uh, is drowning the country's potential. So uh, United States Institute of Peace has formed this uh, group of high-level senior advisory group that comprises of people sourced from all over Nigeria, uh, including uh, former chief of army staff Martin Agwe, uh, Sultan of Sokoto Mohammed Abubakar, and then there's also uh, the Archbishop of Abuja, uh, Cardinal John Oneyekan. Mm -hmm. And amongst the panelists also who are not part of that uh, uh, group of uh, advisory group yeah. includes uh, uh, Ms. Obi Ezekweseli. Yeah. She's uh, the co-founder of Bring Back Our Girls movement mm -hmm. and she was also there at one of the discussions that were focused on it. So they were aiming to bring about all these uh, solutions that could fit the needs of many, solving yes. all these issues that is facing the country. This is, mm. this is uh, you know, a powerful group of people here. Mm. But what are some of the suggested uh, concrete steps mm -hmm. that they said could be taken in, in order to ensure that peace can return to Nigeria? Yes, um, as Martin, uh, uh, the former chief of army staff, stated, he said, uh, if you're trying to uh, uh, cut a tree. If you want, tr if yeah. you want to kill a tree, you have to go to its roots. Yes. Because um, chopping the branches is not going to do the job. So, um, Ambassador Carson said, military solutions is not enough. There has to be other things involved. We have to address the issues at the roots. Some of it, uh, a lot of times, people talk about poverty. Mm -hmm. So we trying. They were trying to expand the conversation around poverty to include like there's more to it than just that. So what is uh, uh, what they're trying to say is social inequality. 
so, uh, economic inequality, yeah. social exclusion are the culprits instead of poverty. Because if that's the case, we would see if that uh, poverty is the uh, culprit, you would see other places where there's uh, uh, poverty. Yeah, there's poverty be, and people don't yeah, get camps. Yeah, yeah, yeah you see that more uh, yeah. happening there than yeah. it is in northern Nigeria or yeah. other parts of uh, that's ravaged so yeah. much. Some people are over, uh, able to overcome insurgency, some were not. So what are like those factors? Mm -hmm. And some of the things too that were uh, touched upon is having uh, good sound leadership that will ensure justice for all, to address all these issues that is facing a lot of the Nigerian youth, who, who many are coming out of school and facing unemployment. It's been estimated three to four million Nigerians are uh, graduating from college and there's no unemployment. So you have that booming population that we are estimated to be the most uh, third most populous country by 2050. Yeah. So this is a big cause for concern. So exactly. what are you doing about it? Mm -hmm. So one of the also uh, uh, issue they raised was restructuring Nigeria mm -hmm. in a way to address all the issues. They're saying the current system they have in, uh, on ground is not enough to uh, make sure everybody yeah. has a piece of the pie. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's a big country, many problems, oh, exactly. but also they have to find some exactly. specific mm -hmm. ways of solving this. But we know that uh, Nigerians are also very, very religious people. Mm -hmm. What did they say would be the role of religion? So that was the key uh, panel discussion that featured Dr. Bogaja on behalf of uh, Sultan of Sokoto and uh, uh, Cardinal uh, John Ayikan and Ms. Obi Ezekwesili. They said, uh, religion has so much potential if only it could be utilized to the purpose because it has all the values, the capacity to handle all these issues that's popping up. However, uh, what is being done is people use it as an alibi to promote nefarious uh, motives. Uh, for example, uh, Dr. Bogaji was talking about how if you look in the Quran, 5% of the Quran is focused, uh, is only focused on the uh, worship, acts of worship. The rest of the time is talking about justice and love for all. If you hate a person, it okay. doesn't matter. You have to still be just to that person. Okay. Mm. You know what? Mm. There's much more we can talk about this, but uh, we will uh, revisit this issue another time. Talk about the big, diverse Nigerian country and how it can be stabilized. Thank you very much for attending the event and for coming to share this. Thank you so much, Mr. Vincent. It's appreciated. appreciate it. Well, that's uh, Mariam uh, Bogadje, who is a VOA House uh, reporter. Now, not too far from Nigeria, the government of one of Cameroon's Anglophone religion, uh, regions rather, has ordered its border with Nigeria closed this weekend in response to calls by activists for protests uh, to demand more rights for the country's English-speaking minority. Now, the Anglophone regions have strong ties to Eastern Nigeria, and authorities may fear that allowing the border to remain open during protests offers the demonstrators a rare base and making it harder to maintain order. Now, Thursday's move represents an escalation in a crackdown of months of protests sparked by complaints about political and economic discrimination in the Anglophone regions of the predominantly Francophone country. Well, Africa 54 business correspondent Jim Malandrino recently moderated panels with key business leaders at the Africa Invest Investment Summit hosted at the NASDAQ market site in New York. Many of the sentiments expressed at the summit were quite encouraging as the overriding theme has shifted from aid to trade to institutional investment to long-term commitment. Now, the first panel role of uh, long-term investors in sustainable African development featured Herbert Dunsell of Africa Investor, Duncan Bonfield of International Federation of uh, Sovereign Wealth Funds, and Lionel uh, Johnson at Pacific Pensions Institute. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the continent, because it comes from a, a low base in, in so many different areas, you know, it's rife for innovation. And we're seeing that right across the board from on logistics and warehousing and, and some of the other um, agribusiness related uh, industries. So we heard from one of our colleagues this morning, who's a sovereign wealth fund, he said, you know, 12 months ago, he wouldn't have touched um, agribusiness. But now it's his number one, uh, you know, fix in his, uh, in, in his um, asset allocation and his portfolio. So there's a lot of opportunity there. But I think the, the, the key thing that we're noticing is that the way that the sovereign fund community and the institutional investment community are really having to reinvent their business models. Um, not only just to be allocators um, of capital, but really project developers in some case, almost the face of investing into, into the particular country. And in some respects, actually you know, running and investing in the companies that are, that are actually operating and maintaining some of these assets. Are there particular regions that are more attractive than others? 
Well, probably, I think, I mean, Western Africa is certainly an attractive region. Nigeria is obviously an economic powerhouse, but if you put in so, some of the other countries there, you, you're talking of a market of 400 million, you've got a young population, you've got a, a good deal of urban, uh, big urban centres. All of those are rife for development, you know, so that's where the growth is going to come from, those young po population who are also looking for those technologies that, that others have as well. So there's a there's real potential there, and obviously Southern Africa is this long been the, the, the powerhouse, if you like, of, uh, of Africa. But it almost seems a little bit more mature than, let's say, the eastern region, where we've seen some significant investment there as well. I would agree. I think it's important also to remember that, you know, Africa is a, a vast continent with, mm. with, uh, with multiple, uh, you know, economies. And um, I think people who look at Africa have to appreciate the diversity of the opportunities as well. Um, we find that uh, one of the more exciting areas, in, in, in addition to increasing connectivity in a digital sense, is the creation and, and development of a consumer class uh, in the uh, continent, which is very, very exciting and offers a number of opportunities. What I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover during the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. Uh, find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Now coming up, exploring high-tech solutions to educate the world's children. Stay with us. is a country that I chose to become a citizen. I didn't have to become a citizen. I chose to become a citizen. I feel like America gave me an opportunity to pursue my passion as an artist. I really believe that clean eating is, is a way to a more successful life or, or a happier life, if, if you want to put it that way. One of the things that helps me wake up every morning is doing better being better. We grew up poor, and so I'm always focused on helping the working class be able to have a more comfortable lifestyle. I'm passionate about doing justice every day. Um, I oftentimes say that justice is a verb, not a noun. You know, I believe in action and moving the ball forward. Now, can children who have been, who have never been to school, teach themselves basic reading, writing, and math skills uh, using only a tablet computer? Well, Elon Musk and the X Prize Foundation are betting fifteen million dollars on the idea that they can. Is viewers Tina Trin? In the developed world, learning numbers with a mobile app like this one is nothing new. But in developing countries like Tanzania the impact can be life-changing. 90% of the kids who will receive these tablets are at zero. 90% of the kids who are going to receive these tablets cannot identify a letter. The challenge of universal education may seem insurmountable, but folks at the X Prize Foundation think it can be solved with technology and a hefty reward. The Global Learning X Prize is a $15 million competition challenging the world's best educational app developers to create an app that lets kids teach themselves basic reading, writing, and arithmetic. Can you develop something that's so intuitive, so inferential, so dynamic that you give it to a child who is illiterate in a very remote part of the world, she picks it up, she touches it, and she begins to learn how to read. And that's the challenge that we put out to the world. 198 teams took up the challenge, and five finalists were recently awarded a million dollars each to test their app with approximately 4,000 children in Tanzania. Creating something that works uh, for children who've perhaps never seen a tablet before, never used a tablet or even television, uh, is, is very difficult. So keeping it simple, keeping it focused on the needs of the individual child and, and adapting to, to how they learn are the key ingredients. Global constraints in school construction and staffing are leading competitors to rethink traditional models of learning. We believe that primary education, which until now has not been really democratized by the evolution of new technology, I think it's ripe for a change. If we can prove that a child needs no instruction other than what's on that device, then we begin 
a series of events that will lead, I think, inexorably to a device that is designed for that child in that part of the world with a teacher on it. In tackling universal access to education, the answers may just lie at the tip of our fingers. Tina Trin, VOA News, New York. Now, staying on the topic of learning, as part of the African Heritage Month in the U.S. state of Maryland, residents and visitors are invited to Teaching Africa Day, an interactive and child-friendly event that is aimed at educating children and youth about Africa. It will also provide a platform for vendors with the best quality books, videos, games, programs, and other resources that teach about Africa and African heritage. To tell us more about it, I'm joined in studio by Paulette Mpuma. She's a founder and creator of the African Memory Game, a game designed to teach more about Africa. Ms. Mpuma, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you for having me. Yes, first, let's just go to this, uh, the whole event. Uh, how did this idea come up again? I think the idea came because we found out we didn't have a platform yes. where we can come together as educators and bring material that can fit for the children of nowadays, for yeah. this generation. Yeah. And here you're talking about both uh, the children of uh, African uh, migrants who are here, yes. perhaps haven't had an opportunity to go back to Africa, mm -hmm. but also you are inviting you know, American kids who may have an interest in Africa, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. American kids, because uh, at school, I, w I want all of the children to have the idea, the great idea of Africa that we know. Yeah. Yes. Now, you know, uh, when people talk about Africa, many times they get excited about Africa in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. They talk about uh, the safari, the wild exactly. animals, the, exactly. you know, people dancing. Exactly. Now, do you have material that also introduces people to Africa uh, in its totality, not the stereotypical Africa? Yes, because in teaching Africa Day, we try to use, like, uh, not only books, but also we try to use material like apps, games. Yeah. We have Jenny apps. We have also the Africa memory game that is like a race of knowledge on the continent. Yeah. So most of it is kind of increasing the knowledge of the children on Africa. Yeah. Uh -huh. And not so much, not just about uh, what I, happens at the national zoo, I mean the game packs, you know, because I even find adults in this part of the world asking me some ridiculous questions. Exactly. You, know, you go to Africa and all they ask you is about wild animals, like exactly. you live in the wild. Exactly. Uh, you get to help the kids know that they're also modern cities, mm -hmm. there are certain historical sites, there are beaches and all those great things. Exactly. What apps do you have available for that or books that you can find here to teach? Okay, to teach Africa, they, we are divided in like uh, mostly like four parts. You have the books part, books and reading, you have the games part, you have board games and you have also video apps, you have the entertaining part that is like also dance, music, language, teaching language like we have Yoruba and Igbo language in apps with Jenny app. We have also a leadership through like Little Malaika and other programs that are helping to actually incorporate the um, the child of the diaspora of the 21st century in all different avenues. Yeah. This mm -hmm. looks like a real valuable uh, form, a kind of education. Uh, is one day enough, one day in a year? Yes. Do you have any, perhaps, a, a idea or many, any plan to have this kind of a more f frequent? It's why we are looking for more partnership. Yeah. And we always invite the State Department and different governors like uh, we invite this year the first lady of the government of the governor of Maryland and we invite also uh, the public um, to you know come together and see if we can fundraise for to have the event at least twice a, twice a year so we're still waiting for support uh, very quickly what was the response to the last time uh, when you had this event? I think it was great because even the idea of having it twice a year came from someone at the State Department. Yeah. He said, why you don't do it twice a year? So it was great also for students because they actually um, have a view of all of the great inventors, all of the great uh, uh, opportunities yeah. that they have, you understand, locally because most of the institutions that come together are local institutions. Oh, great. Uh -huh. I wish you well in this event on Saturday. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank Mr. you. Puma. Thank you.
Well, uh, Paulette Puma is a founder and creator of the African Memory Game. What well, is time now for a Sean Briggs to come on Africa 54? Professional basketball's international reach will be right back. state in which uh, uh, an election which uh, the players should agree on the rules of the game together and the law. Welcome back to Africa 54, and here's what's trending. Now, European airline EasyJet has announced that it wants to be able to provide an electric aircraft for commercial flights within a decade. Now, the company says it wants all of its short-haul flights to use electric aircraft within 20 years. The airline says it has been working closely with U.S. based Wright Electric to make the plane. Well, next up, a tiny robot is able to transform its form and function by putting on different exoskeletons to allow it to perform a variety of different tasks, from walking to rolling and from sailing to even flying. Named Primer by the team at MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, the cube-shaped robot can be controlled via magnets to wear exoskeletons, which start out as sheets of plastic and change shape when heated up. The team says they, uh, they could imagine future space missions where a single robot with a stack of exoskeletons could then perform different tasks by wearing its different outfits. Well, and finally, at a time when imported cereal has all but vanished from supermarket shelves, a newly opened cafe in Cairo is offering its customers a wide variety of the popular breakfast food. Cereal and Flakes is the brainchild of three Egyptian partners who together have a background in finance, marketing and sales, making it the first cafe of its kind in the country. The cafe is located in an upscale Cairo neighborhood. It mainly targets a niche clientele based and foreigners who are willing to pay two to three dollars for a bowl of cereal. And that is what is trending today. Now, the Washington Wizards of the National Basketball Association are getting ready to hit the courts for another NBA season. As viewers Salem Solomon reports, they're part of a league-wide trend that sees more and more international players making their mark on the game. More than ever, basketball is becoming a global game. Last season, the NBA had 113 international players from 41 countries and territories. In all, one quarter of NBA players are international. The Washington Wizards alone have players from Poland and the Czech Republic in addition to two players with roots in Africa. Ian Mahinmi, a 2.1-meter center for France, represents this diversity. His mother is from Jamaica and his father is from the West African nation of Benin. Mahinmi told VOA he grew up wanting to play soccer, but as he kept growing, he realized his future was on the hardwood. I really wanted to be a soccer player and then I grew so tall and eventually I, I gave a shot to a basketball and then fell in love with it and the next thing you know I'm here. As he enters his 10th season in the NBA, he sees the game is growing. Now it's, uh, it's not only soccer now, you know, uh, basketball definitely uh, uh, took a big part in, in, in people's heart. You know, I feel like it's more and more uh, young, uh, young folks that grow up to be basketball player. It's more and more um, African players in the NBA. So it's been, a, it's been a big growth, you know, since I got in the league. The NBA now holds an annual exhibition game on the continent and has opened a youth academy in Senegal. Mahinmi, too, is doing his part, traveling to Benin last summer to teach basketball fundamentals to young players. 
was uh, was unreal. You know, um, the love that they showed me and uh, and the welcoming from the minute we got out the plane till the last minute um, was tremendous. You know, uh, this was probably like the trip of the summer for me and my dad probably the trip of our life. So, um, you know, it's something that we want to do every summer. Wizards head coach Scott Brooks says that as the NBA looks to expand globally, Africa is a big part of its future. Well, I think the entire continent. I think it's so important for us to continue to build our brand as an NBA. And I think Africa is uh, definitely something that we've been considering for a long time. But Adam Silver and the NBA office has done a great job of, of making basketball a worldwide global game. And, and Africa is a big part of that. For now, the Wizards' attention is focused on the upcoming NBA season, which starts off on October 18th. Last year, they won 49 games and nearly reached the Eastern Conference Finals. This year, they're hoping to do better. Solemn Solomon for VOE News, Washington, D.C. And we end our show today with some fantastic music. It is a collaboration between one of the top Congolese artists, Ferry Gala, and one of Kenya's top female artists, Victoria Kimani, and the song, The Chase. Thank you, and have a good night. To English in a minute. Today's episode won't cost you anything. Freebie. Let's see what this one is about. Anna, I love my job. Oh yeah? Why is that? I get so many freebies from the bands I write about. CDs, t-shirts, water bottles, even tickets to see them perform. Wow. The only freebie I ever got from my